The magician's nephew gave us creation and fall. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe gave us uh, a take on the substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. The horse and his boy is a wonderful treatment of providence. Prince Caspian is about loyalty and government, hierarchy also. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is about regeneration. In this book, the silver chair, Eustace, now a reformed character, Eustace Scrub and Jill Pole are summoned into Narnia and they are given a mission, a mission by Aslan. So the silver chair is about the fulfillment of that mission and how Aslan gave certain signs to follow in order to accomplish that mission. The book is about the importance of, the crucial importance of following the signs. So Jill is given the signs after Eustace falls off the cliff at the beginning of the, falls off the cliff of Aslan's country at the beginning of the, of the story. Uh, and after Jill is converted, introduced to Aslan and becomes a disciple of Aslan, he gives her certain signs to follow. And, and it's not just signs to follow, it's certain signs to memorize so that when the time comes, you will be able to follow them. So uh, he, he says, you, you are to hear the signs. These are the things I want you to do. And I want you to recite them. I want you to memorize them. I want you to internalize them. And having internalized them, when the occasion arises where you'll, you'll need it, it'll be right there on the tip of your tongue, right on the edge of your mind. So the silver chair is about the fulfillment of a particular mission. And Aslan gave certain signs to follow and certain signs to be drilled um, to be disciplined in prior to following them. So it's not enough to say, oh, um, this is the sign, I now know what to do. It's, you have to have the, the signs instinctively bred into the bone so that, you will be, so that you will be able to see the sign when it is fulfilled. So it's all about the importance, the crucial discipline of following the signs. It also teaches that salvation is by grace just, uh, excuse me, it teaches that sanctification is by grace, just as salvation is by grace. And, and we see this in that there are four signs given, and the company, um, Puddle Glum, Eustace, and Jill, the company muffs the first three of the four signs. So um, they're given four signs, and they score 25% on their on their final exam, which is a fail. And yet, Aslan is kind to them, and they accomplish their purpose, they accomplish the mission, despite uh, messing up the signs. So we see that the, the signs are given for the purpose of aiding them in their sanctification. The signs are a means of grace, and yet, grace is extended even when the means of grace are bungled. So the means of grace are largely bungled, but they remain means of grace nonetheless. So Aslan is kind to them despite uh, their failure. Now when we, when we come to the silver chair, we've already met Eustace Scrub, Eustace Clarence Scrub. Uh, the Pevensies can no longer come back into Narnia, and Eustace is now the main character. He brings Jill Pole with him to Narnia, and they are given a mission by Aslan. That mission is to find and bring back Prince Rillian, the son of Caspian X, and his queen, uh, Caspian X's queen, the daughter of Ramandu, whom he met in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Glimfeather is an owl who meets them as they arrive in Narnia, and he brings them to Puddleglum, the Marshwiggle, one of Lewis's more memorable creations. If I could note in passing, uh, Lewis's great abilities with names that evoke the um, well, that evoke the character of the person. So, well, Eustace Clarence Scrub is one, but uh, Glimfeather is another. That, that sounds like an owl. Um, Puddle Glum, uh, the marsh wiggle, sounds like, well, Puddle Glum sounds like a marsh wiggle. Puddle Glum agrees to go with them on this uh, mission to the north to search for the lost prince. On their mission, they encounter the Lady of the Green Kirtle, who is in the same family of northern witches as the white witch was. And of course, 
Aslan is a character throughout the book, although he's present only at the beginning and again at the end of it. <coughs> so Caspian, here's the setup. Caspian and his queen have a son named Rillian. When he's about 20, his mother is killed by a green serpent when they were all out on a maying expedition, which was a, a ritual celebrating springtime. Rillian goes out seeking revenge upon the serpent, but he meets with a green, a green lady instead with whom he falls in love. Because she's a witch, now you would think, you would think that Rillian would know what kind of story he was in, but apparently he didn't. Green serpent bites his mom, she dies. He goes out looking uh, for the serpent to uh, avenge himself, avenge his mother, and meets a lady dressed all in green. Hmm. But he, he falls in love with her instead. Because she's a witch, she enchants him, and he disappears from Narnia. Aslan summons Eustace and Jill into Narnia in order for them to find the lost prince. The adventure ensues in which they are faced with many challenges and find themselves failing at many points, 75% of them, uh, if you go by the signs. Aslan, however, is working out his will even through their mistakes. Um, just a, a, a general comment, I'm probably going to develop this uh, more a little bit later on, but keep in mind that Aslan knows where Rillian is the whole time. Aslan's up in Aslan's country. He knows where Rillian is the whole time. And he, uh, he blows Eustace down into Narnia, and he blows Jill down into Narnia so that they can go find the lost prince. So Aslan is looking down. Here's Caspian embarking from, uh, he's going out, uh, going out to sea. He's leaving Narnia, and that's where he blows Eustace and Jill. And Aslan looks over here, and there's Rillian. Well, why didn't he blow them there? <laughs> It reminds me of uh, one comedian um, talking about the Lord of the Rings, said, uh, you know, after Sam and Frodo crawl agonizingly through many adventures, agonizingly through uh, peril and trial, and they escape from Shelob and escape from the orcs, and they crawl up Mount Doom, and then Gollum bites off Frodo's finger, and they throw the, the ring goes into the fire, and, and the mission is accomplished. And then they come out um, onto the mountain waiting for the end of the world, basically. We've had it. We've accomplished our mission. And they are, of course, rescued by eagles. Eagles come down and pick them up and carry them out. The comedian said, wait, we got eagles? <laughs> Why didn't we just fly them in? You know, well, if, um, that, would have been, that would have been much more efficient to fly them in. Yes, but it wouldn't have been a story. You wouldn't, it would have been absolutely, absolutely no fun as a story. So Aslan can um, blow them over here so that they can go over there. Well, why doesn't he send them over there? Because we, then we wouldn't have the silver chair. <laughs> then we wouldn't have a story. And on top of that, Eustace and Jill would not learn the things that they could learn in no other way. So um, in, in order for us to grow in, in order for us to grow and develop character in a certain way, we have to do it through the story. We can't do it by reading the first chapter and reading the last chapter. We have to go through the story. And we have to be characters in the story. We have to obey when we don't feel like obeying. In order, um, in order for our obedience to mean anything, we have to be willing to stay cold. When we don't want to be cold, we have to be willing to stay wet. When we don't want to be wet, we have to be willing to remain in danger when we don't want to remain in danger, and so on. That's what, the, that's what a story does. And God is telling our story, and, and so we, we could, it could occur to us, why doesn't God just create us and then take us straight to where we're going? Well, because being there wouldn't be the same if we hadn't come through the story. So uh, you see this in Lord of the Rings, you see it in all the Narnia stories, you see it in um, this setup where uh, Aslan from Aslan's country sends them down into Narnia when he could have made their way a lot easier. He gave them signs, his grace and his providence accompanies them the whole time. He's being gracious to them, but he's not being so gracious to them 
that they, in effect, do nothing. He, it's not like he just puts them on a conveyor belt and they find themselves at the, at the end of the story. That would be a story that would be, for all intents and purposes, worthless. So before we get to the gift of the signs to Jill that were given to Jill uh, and their importance in the story, we have to discuss for a few moments how she came to be uh, in the position of being able to receive them. Why, why does Jill receive the signs and not Jill and Eustace? And um, how did that all happen? Uh, Eustace and Jill are both students at a place called Experiment House, the kind of modern school that C.S. Lewis loathed. It must be said that he loathed the old kind of school also. <laughs> but he loathed, them, loathed it for um, different reasons. Um, Lewis had a, um, Lewis took a dim view of these, of modern experimental ex education, but he also had some very bad experiences with boarding school himself. Um, one of the boarding schools he was at, it turned out later um, that the headmaster of the school was insane and was um, institutionalized shortly after the school closed. So. Lewis was in, uh, in this school that was run by and disciplined by and managed by a, a, a man for all intents and purposes who was out of his mind. So that was a, that was a problem. Also, Lewis, uh, unlike Tolkien, uh, Tolkien was what in American parlance we would call a jock. So, uh, uh, so was P.G. Woodhouse, by the way. P.G. Woodhouse and Tolkien were both um, uh, very talented athletically. Um, uh, Tolkien was very, he was, a, he was a star. Lewis, however, had thumbs that wouldn't bend. His thumbs wouldn't bend, or didn't have a joint, and he couldn't really handle a ball. Uh, he, was not, he was not a jock. He was the opposite of a jock. He was very studious, um, withdrawn, and when he, he finally was uh, um, given a tutor, Mr. Kirkpatrick, uh, where he was basically uh, able to be the only student or one of two students, uh, he was, he felt like he was in heaven. This is, I, you know, I just want to be with my books. Um, Tolkien, uh, not, not so much. So Lewis had, had every reason to, have, to take a dim view of the old boarding school situation, which he did. At the same time, he thought that the new experimental forms of education were going to be even worse. So, uh, Experiment House is completely secular and is a place where ordinary kids are bullied because the head, we would say headmaster here, superintendent, uh, the head thinks that the bullies are interesting psychological subjects. Eustace, prior to his transformation in the voids of the Don Treader, used to fit right in at Experiment House. He was kind of a second tier toady, um, but he was, he was with the bad gang. But now that he's changed, he's found himself standing up to the bullies who run the school. In this new circumstance, with, with Eustace as a changed character, he comes upon Jill, who is crying behind the gym because of the treatment that she's been getting. As they talk, he tells her a little bit about Narnia and explains the reason that he is now so different. So he re recall that he and... Uh, uh, Edmund and, and Lucy had been swept into Narnia uh, altogether, and he was a pill for the first part of it, and then was turned into a dragon. Then Aslan undragons him, which is his conversion. So uh, Eustace could, Lewis says in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he could still be tiresome at times, but the, the change had begun. He was fundamentally a different boy. He comes back to Experiment House, and everyone notices that uh, Eustace is different. And he explains to Jill the reason why he's so different. They both call out to, to Aslan, but are interrupted by the bullies. In order to escape, they run up to a wall, and there's a door, a door in the wall of the school, of the school grounds, uh, which is ordinarily locked, but they're, they're trapped, and so they try it, and the door is open. They, they tumble through the door, and they find themselves in Aslan's country, not in Narnia, but in basically uh, heaven. As they're walking along there, 
They're just walking along this big slope. They come to the, the edge of a precipice, and because Jill despises Eustace in his fear of heights, she shows off a little by standing a little bit too close to the edge. Uh, so they, they, they walk up, they see it, Eustace panics, you know, pulls back, and she, she basically gets free of him and says, what are you worried about? And, and uh, thinking, of, thinking of it as an ordinary cliff, and uh, she looks down and loses her head. Eustace, trying to keep her from falling, falls himself. So, uh, so she's on the edge of the cliff. Eustace fell off the cliff, cliff having screamed. Uh, this great beast runs up and blows. And uh, Eustace is wafted to Narnia. All, all this is done in order to provide Jill with the same kind of necessary spiritual conversion experience that Eustace had in the previous book. So Eustace um, had to become a dragon and then be undragoned. Jill has to drink living water. So, as you recall, Eustace went through this experience of regeneration uh, in the undragoning um, of himself, and it's not something he could have done by himself at all. He attempted to do it by himself and, and failed repeatedly, and then Aslan undragons him. You know, strips his skin off and then throws him in the water. And notice there's water, or there's a fountain in uh, Eustace's conversion, and there's drinking living water in Jill's. So Jill, even though she was not as insufferable as Eustace had been, she was still in need of the same basic transformation. Uh, she needed to be converted just as Eustace needed to be converted, even though she seemed to be an, quite quite an ordinary little girl, and not the pill, not the uh, insufferable pill that Eustace had been. She still needs forgiveness. She still needs to be uh, transformed. The sin that she commits in Aslan's country sets the stage for this. So after she has a good cry, she discovers that she's terribly thirsty. In other words, she's come to an awareness of her need for grace. I, I need something. She goes looking for water, and she finally finds a stream. Between her and the stream is the lion. So this is the se her second encounter with Aslan. The first she saw him obliquely when he was blowing Eustace. The second is when he's in between her and the water she needs. She feels like she's going to die if she does not get the water. But she would much rather have the water if she could without the lion. <laughs> Wouldn't we all, right? So we, she'd much rather have the water without the lion. She, in talking to him, she quickly discovers that he is the kind of lion who makes no deals when it comes to this kind of thing. He's not negotiating. He's not interested in negotiating. He tells her there is no other stream. It doesn't occur to her to, to disbelieve him. She, she believes him. There is no other stream. And she knows that she's going to die. She's actually going to die if she doesn't uh, come to drink from this one. And he refuses to budge for her sake and makes no promises. When asked if he eats little girls, he says, in effect, maybe. <laughs> Why do you want to know? <laughs> so she asks, do you eat little girls? He replies that he has devoured kings and empires, and that would include little girls. In short, all of this is to make the emphatic point that Aslan cuts no deals, right? No, uh, nothing doing, no deals, no negotiating. And this is um, uh, one of the clear places where, uh, where I would describe uh, Lewis's default reformed assumptions coming out. Um, uh, God is not our servant. Uh, God loves us. He sacrifices for us. He gives to us. He is gracious to us, but he does not, he does not exhibit grace by accepting our excuses or by helping us trim our explanations. He doesn't do any of that. So the repentant sinner who comes to him must do so without any conditions at all. all right, the, you must have no conditions. Um, so she says, all right, she needs the water, and she knows she must have the water or die, and if, if she... If the lion eats her, she might die. You know, she, he might eat her, she might die. But if she doesn't come to the water, she knows she will die. 
So um, it's certain death versus possible death. After she's come to the water in a wonderful picture of conversion, she says to Aslan that she and Eustace had called out to someone named Aslan. Aslan reveals himself to her by name, but also lets her know that she would not have called out to him at all unless he had been, first been calling to her. So we, we called to this person named Aslan, and I'm Aslan, and well, we, we uh, called upon you, and he says, you would not have called to me unless I'd called you first, which is, of course, echoing the language of 1 John. Um, uh, we love because God first loved us. It's not the other way around. Uh, God doesn't love us because we first loved him. Our love for him is responsive. He initiates, we respond. So uh, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. When we come to Christ, it is only possible because Christ has summoned us first. It is not possible for a sinner to initiate coming to Christ on his own. Right? So whenever someone comes to Christ, it is always the case that Christ has been active in that person's life first. So um, the initial serve, the, initial, uh, the initiation is done by God. Now, uh, Jill, so, so Jill is at this point converted. In this, set, in, in this setting, with Jill well converted, Aslan gives her the signs to follow. So she's converted, she's saved, she's forgiven, everything's put right, and Aslan says, here are the signs. The, the language that Aslan uses in teaching her these signs has definite echoes of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. Uh, the signs, these signs are the law of Aslan. They are his commandments. He tells Jill to memorize them, internalize them, get the signs down into her bones, so that when the time comes, the appropriate sign will be seen as fulfilled and complications will then be avoided. This is Lewis's doctrine of sanctification, how a Christian makes progress in the spiritual life. So you read your Bible, you say your prayers, you come to church, you partake of the means of grace. These are the things that you are to do. And in Deuteronomy, it says, you will, here's the, these commandments I gave you. You will talk about them with your children. When you rise up, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, it's, it's to be ever-present with you. The signs that he gives her are to be ever-present with her on this mission. So, All the, Christi the entire Christian life is to be lived out by grace. But the reason for taking the signs in this way is that it gives grace raw material to work on, and that raw material must also be understood as grace. So grace needs something to work on, and the raw material that he gives us to work on is itself a gift, is itself grace. When we see God's word with the eye of faith, we do not set grace and law against each other as though they were enemies. Elsewhere, Lewis compares this whole process to learning how to dance. When someone is first learning how to dance, he is not really dancing. It would be more accurate to say that he was counting. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. He's not thinking about uh, who he's dancing with at all. But once the dance has been mastered, and, and it has to be mastered by some form of rote learning. Okay, so you, um, you just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it which is itself a grace. The opportunity to do that is a grace. So that when uh, the time for the dance comes, you can do that part without thinking about it. So when the dance starts, it's possible for the dancer to stop counting and to start thinking about the one he is dancing with. It's the same thing here. If Jill had done what Aslan had told her to, which was to say the signs every night and again every morning, the signs would have become second nature to her, and she would have been free to think about what Aslan and his uh, free to think about Aslan and his guidance, and he would have had signs in her mind that were that were plainly and self evidently already there, and which could be come come to the surface of her mind quickly. It's like having certain tools out on the table, uh, there, visible, ready to use. All right. 
But as it was, Jill started neglecting her spiritual disciplines, and pretty soon the signs got muddled up in her mind, and then they were distracted by the Lady of the Green Kirtle, who told them that the giants of Harfang would take them, out in, the, uh, take them in out of the cold. Again, notice something. Uh, Rillian could perhaps be excused by not seeing the connection between the green serpent and the lady in the, in, in, dressed in green, because, uh, well, but Jill, having been basically been told, you know, this this story, um, when they encounter a lady, a lady dressed in green, you would you would think that Jill and Eustace would have said, "Hey, I wonder." So um, soon she she and Eustace could think of nothing but getting warm, which is not what they were told to think about. They were not told to think about getting warm or getting in out of the rain. Or get, they were told to think about the signs. Right. So this is not to say that law and gospel cannot be contrasted, but to demonstrate that our attitude toward both of them, the law being the sign, you know, the signs, read your Bible, say your prayers, that you can put that in an imperative, that this is a command, do this. But it could be taken, it can be taken as a command that is simply raw law, or it can be taken as a command which is itself grace. This is a, this is a gift. In one sense, the law and the gospel can be contrasted in the same way that a carrot and a stick can be contrasted in their power to motivate a mule. The stick of God's law threatens the unbeliever as he approaches the holy God, condemning him and driving him to find Christ. God motivates not only with the stick, however, but also with the carrot of the gospel. He offers Christ to the sinner and and with Christ full and free forgiveness. The law condemns the unbeliever, driving him to Christ, and the gospel appeals to the unbeliever, attracting him to Christ. God both pushes and pulls. Uh, he pushes and pulls as we come into his kingdom, and both the pushing and the pulling are all in the same direction, and it's all for purposes of grace. So the reaction of believers and unbelievers to both the law and the gospel is not a story in contrast, but one that shows uh, the great divide between two types of people. Those who reject Christ hate the law of God because it condemns them, but they also hate the gospel. Right? Um, I'll come back and develop this a little bit further. Paul points out this reaction in 2 Corinthians 2.16 when he says that the smell of Christ that pagans sense among the believers, he says, is the aroma of death to them. For those who trust in Christ, however, the gospel is the aroma of life, and law, instead of being only a stick threatening hell, uh, becomes a blessed pathway along which believers walk, because they long to please God with all that they do, say, or think. So in this way, Christians striving to keep the law by imperfectly loving God and their neighbors find the law to be a wonderful expression of God's grace, because he does not leave us in the dark, but rather tells us how to live a life that's pleasing to him. So... uh, just to summarize this, it, this is a, there's a very easy mistake that some Christians make when they talk about law and grace or law and gospel. And that is they lay the Bible out and they say, okay, which passages are law and which pas- passages are grace? And if you could color code it, they would color code the law passages as red and color code the grace passages as blue. Well, you've run into immediate problems. Uh, the Ten Commandments, what's more law e than the Ten Commandments? What's more law-like than the Ten Commandments? But the preamble of the Ten Commandments says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of, out of the house of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What is that? Is that law or grace? And that's the preamble to the commandments. So um, we, we would have real trouble color coding uh, we, we, if we think of, well, which part of the Bible is law and which part of the Bible is grace? That depends on who's reading it. So it's not appropriate. The the whole Bible, everything about the Bible is grace. The whole Bible is grace. Uh, The division between law and grace is a division between people. So the unregenerate heart looks at the Bible and everything about it is condemnation. So the unregenerate person looks at the Bible and the law condemns and the gospel condemns. Both condemn. The regenerate heart looks at the Bible, and the gospel liberates, and the law liberates. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Uh, so you can't, the, the uh, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. So 
uh, if you, you bring a regenerate man and an unregenerate man and show him the same passage, one is going to extract condemnation and the other is going to extract blessing and gift and, and life. Now, Puddleglum remained conscious of the signs, and when they were unwittingly crossing the ruined city of the giants, for example, he was almost on the verge of figuring it all out. But even though he suspected that they were passing by, passing right by two of the signs, he allowed Eustace and Jill to pressure him into abandoning his questions and to come with them. Later, they all recognized this. Later on, they, they recognized the signs they had missed after the fact. And Puddleglum very typically says that he did not do well enough. He says that he should have insisted on working through the signs. I'll just say here that Puddleglum is um, a Scots Presbyterian. <laughs> so this is Lewis's understanding. Um, uh, his uh, Kirkpatrick, Lewis's tutor, was an atheist, and but was a um, uh, was a Scot and would go out on as an atheist he'd go out and garden on sunday but he would dre he would dress up in his sabbath clothes to garden as he was a sabbatarian atheist and mcphee the the uh, skeptic in ransom's company um, says tells ransom that my uncle was the moderator of the general assembly if i ever take to religion it won't be your kind your you know to ransom your bizarre kind with all these creepy things I, you know, if I ever take to religion, I'm going to be a Presbyterian. Well, McPhee and Kirkpatrick and, in some respects, Diggory and the magician's nephew and Puddleglum are all um, this kind of dour Scots Presbyterian Calvinism that Lewis did not partake of but admired, right? He admi and he admired it greatly. So... This uh, relates to another issue. In several places in this book, we see Lewis's resistance to his opposition, uh, his opposition to a philosophy that goes by the name of reductionism. Reductionism. Another simple name for reductionism could be called nothing buttery. Nothing buttery. For example, when someone says that something else is nothing but the matter that makes it up. He is being a reductionist. If someone were to point to um, a sentence on a page that you're reading and say, um, uh, my, let's say you're reading Browning, uh, my love is a red, red rose, and someone were to point to that and say that that is nothing but paper and ink. That's nothing but paper and ink. Now, is that right? Well, yes and no. If, you, if you're talking about molecules, if you're talking about atoms, yes, that's right. There's nothing there but paper and ink. But is there anything else there? Yes, there's information there. And information doesn't weigh anything. Information doesn't, isn't any color. Information isn't so many yards long. Information is spiritual. Okay, so if you... Uh, if you're in a, it's, let's say a sign that says no smoking and someone lights up a cigar and someone comes in to remonstrate with him and says, look, the sign says no smoking. And he says, but that's nothing but paper and ink. That's all that's there. You will not put it under a microscope, analyze the paper, take it apart. You will not find anything there but paper and ink. So I don't have to do what you say. Well, the person would say, no, there is something there. There's a requirement there of this establishment and that I don't care that you can't find that requirement under a microscope. That requirement is there nonetheless. So the reductionist says that Hamlet is nothing but paper and ink. It says that the sentence you're reading is nothing but paper and ink. And that's true on a material level. But that's only, that's only exhaustive if you're a materialist and you say that there's nothing but the material level. And that's what you need to prove. That's what, you, that's what the materialist needs to show. So um, it's possibly true that the sentence in question is nothing but paper and ink physically, although we don't even know that. Right? So uh, I don't think we should grant too much. Uh, but the reductionist approach to the sentence is obviously false. 
The meaning of the sentence is not made out of paper and ink. The meaning of the sentence, the information the sentence contains, is, uh, is carried by the sentence, but it is not bound by, this, by the sentence. Now, uh, one of the things that Lewis does, uh, Lewis loved um, colliding with, arguing with, engaging with reductionism. He does it throughout his essays. He does it in multiple places. He does it all the time. And it comes out in the silver chair. If someone says, for example, um, this sentence is in English. The sentence I just spoke is in English. It's a self-referential statement, and it's true. Okay? If someone says, this sentence is in Latin, uh, this sentence I am now speaking is in Latin, it's a self-referential um, statement, and it's false. It's not in Latin. If I say, this sentence that I am now speaking is false, is that true? That would make it false, right? Making it true again, meaning that I'm in a barber shop watching the back of my head go off into the mirrors into an infinity. Um, and it's not, uh, I would say it's neither true or false, because if it's, meaning it's nonsense. So I, I can configure words together that have the optical illusion of containing meaning, but they, they, they don't. Sleeping green ideas jump up and down furiously. Or uh, twas brilligan the slithy toves did guy and gimble in the way. Or because ice cream has no bones and the higher they fly the much. So I can say things like that and, and say the ice cream has no bones. Well, the, <laughs> that would be false. Um, but the higher they fly the much, you can garble it up Let's go back to Twas Brillig and the Sloves, Twas Brillig and the Slide of the Toves. You've got nonsense. It's just gibberish, right? It doesn't have anything, anything it doesn't carry any meaning. So if someone says, there, um, this sentence is false, this sentence I'm now speaking of is, is false, that's a very cleverly devised nonsense statement. It's, it's, it doesn't point to anything. Um, it doesn't carry any meaning. It doesn't, doesn't rise to the dignity of being true or false. Now, I want to argue, and I think Lewis would want to argue, that there is no God is not false. There is no God is not a false statement. It's incoherent. It's nonsense. Right? It, because in order to say it, in order to say there is no God, it, I, have to be, I have to be functioning in a, in a universe that has coherence that makes sense. And if there is no God, then nothing makes sense, including me. Okay? If there is no God, then I'm just, the, I'm just atoms banging around. If there is no God, the materialist claim is true, that that sentence is nothing but paper and ink. But if the materialist claim is true, that that sentence is nothing but paper and ink, then I have no reason for believing there is such a thing as paper and ink. I've, I, every, the, the whole floor collapses under underneath me. I can't, if there is no God, I can't think at all. I can't function at all. Lewis is, uh, Lewis is reductionism's deadly enemy. He hates it. He chases after it. He, um, particularly in the first few chapters of Miracles, if he says, uh, he, where he says, um, basically, if my, my thoughts are just merely the motion of atoms in my brain, if that's all it is, then I have no, ra I have no reason for believing my brain to be composed of atoms. Then I, I, everything comes apart in my hands. So, Lewis places a high priority on countering reductionism wherever he could. In the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, for example, Eustace is corrected when he says that in his world, a star is a, is a flaming ball of gas. The response is that even in our world, that's not what a star is, but only what it is made of. Okay, so you point to that sentence. What that sentence is, what, what that sentence is made of, is paper and ink. Or what this sentence is made of is the motion of atoms in the, in the air of the room. Uh, that's what it's made of. But that's not what it is. That's not the heart of it, because what something is, is a spiritual reality. Pointing to what a thing is made of and reducing it to only that is an extremely dangerous mistake, according to Lewis. A person who is created in the image of God is nothing but 
a certain number, number of ke chemicals that could be purchased with relative ease and which do not cost that much. Inflation has probably affected it, but I saw a calculation of all the chemicals in the hu human body could be purchased for a dollar ninety-seven. So, you know, if you just took all the chemicals in the water and everything, it makes up that's a dollar ninety-seven. And yet, a human being is much more than the chemicals that make up the body. In the silver chair, Lewis attacks reductionism in several places. The first place is where he simply illustrates the error. One of the signs that they were to follow, um, one of the signs was that they were to follow certain instructions they met when they came to the ruined city of the giants. They took this as following the words under me, which they had come across in snow without recognizing them. When they saw the words from Harfang, it was obvious that they had to get under the ruined city. So they were looking out on a ruined city of giants, and there was a big inscription. And the inscription says, under me, if they had figured it out when they were there, they should have looked around for a place to get under the inscription. When they saw the words from Harfang, it was obvious that they had to get down there. But when the enchanted Rillian hears this, he dismisses it as laughable. The words were all that remained of an ancient and larger inscription. Rillian says, that was nothing but a coincidence. Okay, so you took under me as instructions to get under those words, but I can tell you the, um, the, the longer and more ancient inscription that had nothing to do with you kids. That it was, that was already there. It was, it was all a, uh, a coincidence. Those, this is, these words are nothing but the uh, remainder of an ancient inscription. After Puddleglum ruined the witch's attempt at re-enchanting them by filling the room with the smell of burnt marsh wiggle, um, he then answered her attempts to enchant them with her reductionism. That's what, that's what the witch is doing. Lewis is showing clearly that his view uh, is that this materialistic philosophy is little better than witchcraft. The witch was saying that Aslan was nothing but a cat, made bigger by the imagination. She said that the, nothing, the sun was nothing but a lamp made bigger by imagination. Puddleglum defies her by saying that it is not true, but that even if it were true, he would not submit to her. If the world was nothing but what she pointed to, then the world was a pitiful place, and if the only place to get away from that world was through the imagination, then so be it. He was going to be a Narnian even if there were no Narnia, and he would serve Aslan even if she was right and Aslan did not exist. I want to point out, it's important here to distinguish Puddleglum's wonderful statement of dogged loyalty here with a common device found among liberal theologians when they say what matters is not that Jesus rose from the dead, but rather that we believe and proclaim that he did, right? So there are some liberals who say, well, it doesn't really matter if he actually rose. What matters is that we stick by him and preach as though he had. Um, that's not an answer to the thrumming of the witch. It is the thrumming of the witch. So this brings us back to the matter of the signs. Because Puddleglum was a faithful Narnian, the things of Aslan were settled in his bones. This fundamental act of faithfulness in defying the witch when he stomped on the fire was one which arose from a long force of habit. But the time of testing, the time when you are being enchanted, is not the time to develop a habit. Okay? You can't develop the habit when you are called upon to use it. The habit is either already developed and it can be drawn upon, or it is not and it cannot be. So the reason Aslan gave the signs to Jill in, the, in Aslan's country was so that they would have time to develop an instinctive reliance upon the signs, an instinctive turning to Aslan, an instinctive way of doing it his way when you didn't feel like it. So this is why Aslan gave them a long journey with testing on the way. So um, I asked at the beginning, so Aslan's looking down from Aslan's country, you could send them to Narnia, but Rillian's over there, why didn't he just blow them over there, give them say, hey Rillian, why don't you release him? Well, because when they got to Rillian's place, they wouldn't have anything in them, they wouldn't have any resources um, 
to call upon in order to act faithfully there. Even the failures to obey the signs are, are, are used by Aslan to teach them. So um, the, journey, the long journey, failures and successes both included, are um, times of development where Jill and Eustace are being prepared to do the right thing. So this is why Aslan gave them a long journey with testing on the way. That testing was so that they could instill certain habits so that when the ultimate test came, they would have reserves to draw upon. There would, there would be something there that had been instilled in them. A uh, story is told of a, a farmer who had a number of sons, and he was a wealthy farmer, and uh, while all the other boys were down at the swimming hole on, on Saturday enjoying themselves, he had his sons out working in the field, and one of his neighbors uh, came by and said, um, I can't, I can't believe you've got all the money in the world. I can't believe you've got your sons working in the field. You've got all the corn you want. Why, what are you working on raising corn? And, he's, and the farmer replied, I'm not raising corn. I'm raising boys. Right? I'm not raising corn. I'm raising boys. So there are certain things that cannot be acquired, certain characteristics that cannot be acquired unless you go through a tough stretch. It just doesn't happen. All right, so Aslan wanted them, part of the mission was not just to get Rillian back, but it was to get Jill and Eustace to a certain point in their lives. So that's part of the mission too. It's not just this, these people are the agents who fulfill the mission and then nothing is, uh, uh, nothing different about them. No, something's different about them and that's part of what Aslan is up to. Aslan blew them from his country into Narnia, but he could, have ju he could just as easily have blown them to the ruined city of the giants and saved everyone a lot of walking. But his point was not to save on the walking, but rather to build a certain kind of character in Eustace and Jill, the kind of character that would arise to the occasion when necessary. So he gave them the journey, along with something that would cultivate that kind of character during the course of the journey. That's the point of the signs. So um, think, of it this, think of it this way. Sanctification, um, learning to love God, sanctification, walking with God, is not a matter of being given a list of things that you shouldn't do, and you try to get through your life without doing those things, or... You know, if you make it through your life with um, more than half of the checklist checked off, or you, then you're okay. Or, uh, it's not like that. We are all, everybody in the world is in the process of becoming somebody. Everybody is becoming someone. And they are becoming either one of the saved or one of the damned. They are becoming either an inhabitant of Aslan's country or an inhabitant of the outer darkness. And what's happening to us here is fitting us for where we're going to wind up. Damnation is like the ultimate golemization of a person. It's not, oh, he did this and this and this. It's not as though everybody's going to stand before God at the last day and everybody is the same, with the exception of these people have done those things and these people haven't done those things. Um, no, it's... In the, in the act of doing things, you are becoming something. When you love someone, when you take something, when you eat something, when you walk somewhere, you are becoming the person who did that. You're becoming the person who is that way. And, and so consequently, uh, sanctification culminating in ultimate salvation is the process of becoming someone. You, uh, so become the someone that God intended for you to become. You walk into that. And obedience is part of that. And then repentance upon disobedience is part of that. So this is why they can muff the signs, or this is why they can muff three of the signs and still uh, get the fourth one and still uh, be successful. Because it's not a matter of, I, earlier I joked, it, oh, they got a 25% on the quiz, but that's not what it, that's not what it is. It's sort of uh, every teacher knows um, when you're looking at a string of grades, uh, a string of students' grades, it matters whether the crummy grades are at the beginning of the semester or at the end of the semester. 
it matters if they got a poor start, but now they're finishing strong, or they had a strong start, and now they're, fi they're falling apart. That matters, right? The trajectory matters. The storyline matters. What's going on in their life matters. So that's the point of the signs. The signs were not absolutely necessary to the finding of Rillian. Aslan knew where Rillian was the whole time, and he could have just told them. If he wanted to use Eustace and Jill in the rescue, he could have made it easy for them. But easy establishes no character, number one. It establishes no character, and it makes for dull reading. If Tolkien had written a book where the eagles flew Frodo and Sam into, over the Mountain Doom and they dropped the ring in as they flew by, uh, none of us would have ever heard of J.R.R. Tolkien. We wouldn't read his book. When God gives us his law, and he instructs us to meditate on it day and night, and to teach our children when we walk along the road and when we rise up, when we lie down, he's not taking a shortcut. He's taking the long way. We too readily think that God is interested in the rules for their own sake, rather than seeing that he's interested in growing up a certain kind of creature. The kind of creature he wants to grow is the one who can think of doing this when it seems that everything in his mind and body wants to do that. Okay, that's the, that's the issue. Uh, and, and Aslan tells Jill this when, he, um, when he's giving her instructions in Aslan's country. He says, up here the air is clear, uh, everything is crystal clear. When you, as soon as you get down there, it's going to get foggy, it's going to get blurry. It's going to get hard to remember. There are going to be times when you, want to, when you have to get up and you don't want to get up. There are times when you have to stay up late and you don't want to stay up late. There are times when you want to pursue this illicit good and your body says, yes, 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 and, and you're saying, no, I, I, I better not. Once out of Aslan's country, the air is thicker. That's the way Lewis puts it. The air is thicker and the distractions are great and many. In such a place, signs are a great help and, in, and encouragement in accomplishing what God wants to accomplish. So, um, look, when you're in this situation and, you, and the air is thick and you don't know what to do, basically what it boils down to not doubting in the, in the, uh, in the dark what you do in the light. You can't see, you can't, you can't hear, you can't remember, so you should go feel for the thing that you put there for this purpose. There, there, there's a sign, there's a Bible verse, there's a, a prayer that you pray, there's a way, there's a way you go, because, because God knew that I was going to need that kind of help in this kind of situation, and I need to be tied off. And the signs, of, the, the signs or the means of grace are the things that tie us off. Because we live in a world very much like Narnia, in this regard, it would be safe to say, very safe to say, that C.S. Lewis is wanting children to learn how to say their prayers, say their prayers daily, to read their Bibles daily, and to go to church. Otherwise, they'll never find and defeat the witch. It's simple. These are the signs. Do them. And do them until they become habitual. Do them until they are instilled in you. Basically, virtue in the classical, in the classical tradition that Lewis was very much part of, and he was part of the Christian classical tradition. Virtue is a function of habit. Virtue is a function of habit, and th those habits are instilled by doing the same thing every day. And then, if you don't do it one day, you, it's not like oh, I broke a rule. It's like I didn't. Did I not eat breakfast this morning? I'm noticing something. You know. I'm noticing something, that something's missing. Um, if, you, if you had to rush and get out the door and you realized around 10 that you actually forgot to eat breakfast, you wouldn't feel guilty. You'd feel hungry. Right? That's, that's the way virtue is instilled. That's, how, that, that's what uh, Lewis is encouraging, how Lewis is encouraging children to think.